Hello, I am Martha Seelman. I'm the executive director of Studio Art Quilt Associates, and I'm really enjoying being part of planning Sakwa's seminar on color. Today, I have the pleasure of talking with Luana Rubin, who is the founder and CEO of eQuilter, um, the, I've, as far as I know, largest purveyor of beautiful quilting fabrics online and a place where I get a lot of my own fabrics as well. Over the years, Luana and I often connect at places like the International Quilt Festival in Houston and have dinner together. And she will tell me little snippets about how she's part of a color forecasting group called the Color Marketing Group. And I thought that as part of the Sakwa seminar on color, you would really enjoy getting a little bit deeper information about how color forecasting works and how Luana uses that in her work choosing and purchasing fabrics to stock at eQuilter. So Luana, welcome. And can you tell us a little bit about color forecasting in the color marketing group? Sure. Well, I discovered this group uh, about 10 or 12 years ago, and I immediately knew that I needed to become a member. I had to jump through a lot of hoops to be accepted as a member. I had to prove that I had a business where I was working with design and color forecasting. And actually a lot of the people in this group are part of very big industries. So for instance, cosmetics and paint and uh, the electronics that are used for, you know, the case for your laptop and your cell phone so and so on and the person who chooses the color of the armrest on the fifty thousand uh, dollar new airplane first class suite i mean you know car automatic metallic fin finishes so i really wanted to be a part of that and part of it is because i have been a part of that for so many years i've been working in design uh, and forecasting both in the garment and textile and, and also obviously in the quilting industry since 1980. Oh my God, I'm so old. <laughs> but I had been going to the Pantone and other color forecasting presentations since those days when I was going, I, when I worked on 7th Avenue in New York, for instance. So I knew that that whole world was out there and I was always drawn to it and, and worked quite a bit with it. And I thought, well, why not use that in the quilting industry? Just because we're a smaller, more personal industry doesn't mean that we don't have an interest or a need for something like that. So I applied and I jumped through their hoops and I got in and I was immediately uh, asked to be put in one of the most forward groups because I'm more fashion oriented. You know, the colors that I see as forward are going to be more aligned with fashion uh, as opposed to people who are picking colors for carpet in hotels or furniture or tile or things that are more long lasting. You know, uh, some of the bright, really forward, crazy colors that we just love wouldn't look so great in the hotel of a lobby, right? So, so that's why color forecasting. Can you tell us a little bit about how it actually works. What do you do? Mm -hmm. I know you go to a meeting. Mm -hmm. What do you do before the meeting? What happens at the meeting? And then how does that affect your choices after the meeting? Okay. Well, it's a collaborative organization and we all have really strong opinions about what colors are coming next. In my case, often the colors that I bring to the meetings are colors that are happening now. And when I go to the meeting, we're forecasting colors that will be available to all the industries two years from now. So if there's a color that's really catching my eye and I think, wow, this looks really fresh and new and exciting to me. And I think this color is starting to bubble up in my industry and in the fashion industry. Uh, you know, maybe we see it on the runways in Paris and New York and Italy, for instance. And, but it hasn't come out in general to the general public or in our industry yet. I will take those colors and I bring a palette of colors and a story to back up, you know, why are these colors uh, trending forward? Why do I expect these colors will be happening in the future? And I go with my palette and I tell my story 
And then we break out into groups of about 10 people. Maybe there are a few hundred people who come when, we, when we're meeting in person. Of course, this last year we didn't meet in person, we met online. And I attended both the North American and also the Asian Pacific meetings. Um, I often am a facilitator, so I help to facilitate at the Asian Pacific meeting. So anyway, we get together and we collaborate and sometimes argue and discuss. And we have these deep philosophical discussions about what the old color is and therefore what the new color is going to be and what's going on in the world. You know, lately it has a, had a lot to do about the environment and unfortunately about politics. Uh, and what is happening with human rights and so on. I mean, we really felt, for instance, that the flags and banners of the human rights protests were going to have a strong influence. And actually that's been going on for many years. So we talk about those influences. In the past years, we had the luxury of talking about things like pop culture influencing, but you know, the world is really disturbed right now. And so that's a lot of what's driving the colors that we're thinking about you know, when we got together this last year, we wanted to be positive. We wanted to believe that two years from now, we'll be coming out of this malaise. So we were very positive, you know, very, very uh, optimistic and maybe idealistic about what colors would be happening in, in the next couple of years. What, what does it mean to be optimistic? What, <laughs> what kind of a color is optimism? Okay, well, a less optimistic shade of purple might be a muted, uh, dusty mauve. And a more optimistic color might be a warm, sort of jammy, pinkish plum color. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So it used to be in the fashion industry, we'd say that when the economy was good, we had more toned down neutral colors. And when the economy was was bad, we had more bright colors, but now I think we use color to express where we're at, you know, how we feel. So when we're feeling uh, kind of down, we, we tend to choose colors that are, that are sort of pulling ourselves in and disappearing or, you know, are keeping our energy kind of close and just in survival mode. But when we're happy and expressive, then we tend to really choose those daring colors. So some of the, you know, like bright, like I was mentioning that pinkish, warm, jammy plum color, um, you know, I think of it as berry jam. People usually know what I'm talking about then. And warm greens, you know, like lime and kiwi and avocado greens. To me, those are more colors of optimism and growth and renewal. And they're juicy colors, you know, and in our industry, we really enjoy being creative. So when we see a color like that, we may use all those colors. We may use a lot of toned down colors and use something like that as a pop of color. And of course, in a successful piece of art, you're using a combination of bright colors and other colors that maybe are more recessive, um, more calm in order to show off the bright colors. You know, We'll use a combination of warm and cool colors. We use combinations of different values, light and dark. So for instance, we might use a bright yellow green to show a highlight and a deep dark purple to show a shadow and so on. Mm -hmm. So how do we use it? Um, yeah. I, so, you know, because we collaborate and argue <laughs> and, and boil that palette down, we have to make compromises because we, you know, we're a group of people from many different industries. So we have to come up with a palette that we can all live with. Some of them are more forward, some of them are more subdued, but they all have to fit into a story. And we agree on the stories, we vote on the stories. And we say, yeah, this is what's really going on. This is the story that we wanna focus on. And so normally by the end of the event, we have three stories and each story has a palette of colors. And then in the end, there's an overall palette and we do choose a focus color, an overall color that's most important to us, kind of like a color of the year. Mm -hmm. And honestly, individually in my industry, I may or may not agree with that, but it really doesn't matter. You know, it's more about the process of getting together with other people whose whole life is color. So when I go to these meetings, it's like being with my tribe. People who are color and trend forecasters, 
their brains just don't work like normal people. And I like that. I like being with those people. You know, we talk the same language. We tell the same stupid jokes, you know, about chroma and hue and tint and things like that. You know, just like when you go to a Photoshop uh, conference, people tell Photoshop jokes and obviously quilt jokes, you know, not just about fat quarters, but all the other silly things that we love to play with. So I come home and maybe a month later, I get a swatch card with actual, you know, very precise painted chips of those colors that we chose. And yet these are colors that are, that are being predicted two years from now. But I feel that they apply to me right away. Um, I also participate in a group that does forecasting of trends for more like five years in the future. But instead of focusing on color, we focus more on trends and ideas and, and movements of what's happening, uh, not just with humanity, but with technology. You know, we look at uh, the, the technical technological advances that are occurring that are likely to influence our products, our finishes, our production. So for instance, over the last 10 years, we've had a huge change in our industry of switching from screen printed to digital. And what that means is we can now, we, we now have a palette of colors that's limitless. And also the repeat has gone from being limited by 24 inches for screen printing to whatever we want. I mean, we could print something 10 feet long if we thought there was a market for it. Uh, and I've seen a few panels that have been two or two and a half yards long. So to me as a designer also, and as a retailer and a trend watcher, uh, the digital has been really, really exciting. So it's interesting to see those parallel kinds of uh, technology trends that we don't always know about, but when we all come together, everybody brings a piece of that and we put all of those future technologies together and we come up with kind of a feeling of where things are going. Uh, of course, the last year kind of feels like all bets are off. I mean, we can, we can project. I think, I think now we see more clearly where we're going in the future compared to last spring. It was very difficult to see where we were going last spring. We tried really hard. And I, I think, uh, you know, the dart hit the board about half the time, but there were some other things that happened later in 2020 that we could not have anticipated. And of course, then you have things like what happened last week at the Capitol. So, um, you know, th those are things that you can't, you, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to go off on a political tangent, but, you know, we can think that something like that might happen, but when it actually happens, it's earth shaking in terms of how it's going to affect business and technology and even trend forecasting. How I use it here is those colors that we boil down into a palette, they're already in my brain. I've seen them bubbling up already. So it's more like a confirmation of what I already believe and what I already see. And um, it's, it's exciting. I mean, when the colors I believe in come to pass, it's exciting for me. When you get these swatches that have those very precise colors, do you then go to the fabric manufacturers and say, these are the colors that I am looking for? Yes, and I would say indirectly. So the palettes that we get are proprietary. So we have to agree not to publish them, not to share them. I mean, I do share them with my buyers because I want them to see what I've been working on. One time we did host a meeting, a regional meeting here. So I had a couple of my employees attend so they could see what it was all about. That was kind of fun. But I, it's more like I give feedback to them. I say, you know what? I see this particular shade of teal or this particular shade of bright yellow green as trending very strongly. I'm looking for it, nobody has it. You guys had it, but we ran out of it in 24 hours. And you say you're not reprinting, but I think you should reprint because it's a very strong, and I'll let them know, you know, this is a color that was identified by the color marketing group, or this is a color that we've identified as starting to bubble up and sell to our particular demographic. Now remember, every business has to identify their demographic and they have to develop a set of products, which includes colors that's specific to their demographic. So for instance, my company 
has always been very focused on the more contemporary quilter, the more creative, uh, adventurous, artistic quilter. And another shop may be more focused on a more uh, traditional clientele or a more modern clientele. You know, we try to include modern as well, but we're less likely to carry those, um, you know, traditional Civil War type colors, for instance, because that is not about trends, that's more about tradition. And there's a big difference, you know, businesses often are successful because they focus on a niche. And there's a big difference between those two kinds of businesses. Sure. And when you talk about color, the touchstone for me is thinking back to quilts from like the 1930s that mm. have that apple green and, mm. and that very pretty pastel pink. And then looking at colors that are more contemporary, where it's a lime green, green, it's much more in your face. And it's a really, you know, hot pink or magenta pink. And it, and for me, that's my re frame of reference to understand, oh. you know, a lot of what you're talking about. So you said that the mark, the forecasting that you did last spring um, is probably only half accurate given how things have changed. So does that mean that you are changing your thoughts about what to order for eQuilter? I am. And I think that there is room for more calming colors. Uh, I think that last year we were really on a roll with bright, exciting colors. And I think now people are unsure. They're, they're feeling you know, they're becoming more interior focused rather than exterior focused. So I see a lot more colors that are, you know, what you might think of as spa colors and natural colors and, and also colors from nature, right? So we know that when we're going through a stress and a crisis like we have been in the last year, we're drawn to colors of nature, colors of the forest, colors of water, colors of stones and rocks. Um, you know, stones and rocks are gray and maybe brown or something like that, but, um, and, you know, earth colors. But they're colors that are soothing and calming at a time like this. So I, I see that reflected in what our more uh, contemporary customers have been desiring over the last six months or so. Um, I still see those punches of color. And of course, the, those two colors I mentioned, the yellow green and the, and the warm purple, those are still you know, natural healing colors, but they're colors of growth and juicy colors as I call them. They're, they give you like a pop of energy. So there's a lot of combining of those two categories of colors. You're, you're mentioning the stones um, is a nice segue into my next question, mm -hmm. which is Pantone came out with their color of the year, except that it's two colors. Mm -hmm. And one is a gray, a sort of mm -hmm. light to medium gray. And the other is a very, what I would say, warm yellow, yellow with a fair amount of orange in it. Mm -hmm. So how does Pantone's announcement mesh or not mesh mm -hmm. with what the color marketing group does? Mm -hmm. Well, the Pantone color of the year is based on them serving uh, fashion designers and other types of designers on what has sold, what is on the water, what has already been produced and is going to be coming out into the stores in the early part of this year. So it's announced in December they already know that these are colors that are happening. And, you, and why do they show up in stores? Because those colors have already been produced and are on their way. So, you know, the, the surveying part of it is that maybe a year ago, the designers were developing those palettes or maybe last spring, just when all of this was breaking open. And they were showing it to the buyers of the retail stores and the buyers were looking at it and saying, oh, these are the colors that I want. And then, okay, fine. These are the colors we're going to produce. 
in higher quantities, and then they're going to be shipped to stores. At the I mean, there's this whole supply chain thing that happens that consumers generally don't really think about, but it takes a long time to conceive of something, design it, produce it, and ship it, and have it distributed to the stores. And then you walk in and look at it and go, oh, that's just what I need, just what I want. Didn't know I wanted it till I saw it, right? <clears throat> and quilters often are really good or bad at that, depending on <laughs> who's paying for their credit card, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, the difference between Pantone and Color Marketing Group. So Color Marketing Group is for people in the industry who have to work way out in advance. Pantone is really more for the consumer. So they're saying, hey, consumers, you're going to see this color get ready for it, here's what it means, here's what it represents, here's what we've all gone through together, and we may or may not realize it yet, but this is a color that we're all, as a mass consciousness, ready to, ready to experience. And it's not just a color that we would wear, it's colors that we would put in our home, it's colors we would buy in a car, right? It's colors that go in graphic design, in magazines, and, and on websites, so there, it's a color trend that, that is going to spread through the, the whole color sphere of our reality over the next year. And the yellow is a very optimistic, bright, I mean, it reminds me of like sunshine and daffodils and really positive things, but it's a clear, bright yellow. It's not like a deep sunflower or safflower, right? It's, it's like lemonade or limoncello or something like that. And the gray is very calming and soothing and somewhat grounding. It's not as grounding as a dark earthy color, but it's very atmospheric. And it, because it's neutral, it leaves room for thing, other things to be expressed or compared to it. it so you know, so it is, your, your juicy colors. Yeah, right. Your juicy colors would pop beautifully against that gray. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And of course, when they predict a color like that, it doesn't just include that exact shade, but you'll see different iterations of that. So darker or lighter, um, more or less saturated. I mean, it's just kind of a starting point and then a lot of products will spin off from that starting point. Do you think that it is useful for artists and quilt artists to pay attention to those colors of the year and try to incorporate them in what they're making. It's always useful to look at color trends. I mean, there are opinions about color trends that are being expressed on all different levels for all different industries all the time. And how, what is its usefulness? Its usefulness is to kind of jog our creativity and get us to think about that color. So if a color comes out that's trending, if you care about selling your work, for instance, you could choose to incorporate that color because it might be more saleable. It might be more acceptable or desirable if you use that color. Um, you may see a color and just say, there's no way I would ever use that color. And then you think, well, what if I use it? What if I just try using it as an accent color just to challenge myself? So remember many years ago, there was that intense orange color that came out as a Pantone color of the year. A lot of people had a visceral response to it, but you know what? Over the, pa over the two years, not just that year, but even more so the year after that, we started seeing orange in everything. And I saw a lot of it, uh, you know, in the color marketing group, one of the exercises that we have to do is identify what industries we think these colors will be used for. That color was used a lot in outdoor wear, in tents, in backpacks, in jackets. It's in the shoelaces on your mountain boots, things like that, you know? And so I, I like the creative challenge of that is just looking at a crazy color and thinking, who the heck would use this color, you know? Or a color that I might think is kind of boring, but then I think, okay, I can see this being used as tile or, or as, drapes in a hotel or things like that, you know, where you want something uh, to live for a long time. You know, a hotel doesn't want to change their colors every two years. They want to have something that's going to last for 10 years that has a, a lifespan. Mm -hmm. 
And certainly looking at the work that's being juried into various um, art quilt exhibitions, there has been a huge shift towards oranges and those orangey yellows in the works mm -hmm. that are accepted. Not to say that mm -hmm. all of the works have those colors, but a much mm -hmm. greater percentage have right. those oranges than if you look at, um, you know, five, 10 years ago and the same quilt exhibitions, um, you weren't seeing any orange, you were seeing mm -hmm. neutrals uh, and rusts. And, and so mm -hmm. um, all of a sudden, yes, there, there's yeah. definitely a movement towards a lot more orange mm -hmm. in what artists are working with. It kind of cracked us open to consider the possibilities. Mm -hmm. And also it normalized it for us. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, so you said that this past spring's group of colors, um, you think really are only half accurate. So does that mean um, that you maybe have stocked up on colors that you think now aren't going to sell? Hmm. Well, there are always things that sell more or less than you predict. Um, I, I will say humbly that I think part of the success of our business is we have a better track record at picking winners and predicting trends than a lot of businesses. I mean, that's one of our strengths of our company. Um, whether I've had more things now, actually, you know, what's happened this last year is our business has gone up and sadly, part of that is due to quilt shops having to shut down temporarily or some permanently. Uh, but we were able to remain open as an essential business and we actually expanded our staff and we were working like 10 or 12 hour days, sometimes six days a week to supply people with fabrics for face masks, right? because we had this army of sewing volunteers who switched, they dropped everything else they were doing. And I, I'll tell you, like our most famous successful quilters, I, I, you look at all the top names, that's what most of them were doing. But the problem was we couldn't get fabric because the manufacturers and the warehouses were shut down because of COVID. So we sold things that we would have closed out. We sold them, we couldn't keep them in stock. So this has been a very strange year in that sense. Um, I think that, that we have a lot of new customers, you know, the people who we hoped would have bought those colors, but weren't necessarily a customer of ours. We could have ended up closing them out. Nope, those people, the, those people found us and purchased those colors. I, I don't know what the future holds. I'm not attached to what's been happening continuing. Um, we may stay busy. It may go back to some kind of new normal. I mean, clearly we're never gonna return to the old normal, but I don't know what the new normal will be. So that's the part of the forecast that we just, we don't know. I mean, we have to make plans. We have to make plans, you know. I'm purchasing fabrics and choosing colors that are shipping six months from now. So a lot of it is intuitive. I, you know, when I make purchases, I look at a combination of the information that I know that I've collaborated on with the color marketing group, uh, other color forecasts from organizations like Pantone and there are many other as well. Um, and I do my own process of what colors I think are going to be strong. And we talk about it here and we talk to the buyers and mostly it's just if we see a color that just sells out overnight, we go, wow, look at that that's a new trend bubbling up. We have to jump on that. We have to expand it. We have to get out ahead of it. Uh, and that often happens. If we don't jump on it really fast and get out ahead of it, it'll sell out. Our, our suppliers will sell out of that and we won't be able to get it. So uh, we tend to be really aggressive on jumping on trends and nailing down what we need to be able to stock that for our customers. Mm -hmm. I, I have one more question for you about okay. Uh, forecasting, which mm -hmm. is that we spoke um, maybe the next day after President-elect Biden and Kamala mm -hmm. Harris gave their acceptance of, you know, having gotten mm -hmm. enough votes presentation. Mm -hmm. And Kamala Harris wore an all-white outfit. <laughs> and you said to me, 
that's important. Can you mm -hmm. expand a little bit about why you felt that was important and how that maybe is going to influence what you'll say when you meet this year for your marketing group? Mm. Well, black and white are always considered basic colors, so we don't necessarily put them on the trend forecast. But it was important for several reasons. I think the most important reason is that it represented the suffrage, suffragettes or suffragists. Uh, and of course, this is the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. And uh, we have been a sponsor for Deeds Not Words that has been traveling. In fact, it just opened up in Texas. And so when I saw her walk out in that, it just hit me. It was almost like, you know, she was just glowing in that color. And it made such a statement. I mean, who would have the chutzpah to, to come out in a completely white pantsuit and not look like John Travolta, you know? But the, everybody knew that's not what it meant. It, I think most people understood immediately that it was making a statement. They maybe had to think about it for a while uh, to realize that it had to do with the suffragist movement. But you know what else it represented to me is illumination, clarity, shining a light into dark spaces, you know, uh, bringing the truth out. And it reminded me of what happened after 9-11. So after 9-11, and, you know, I used to live in New York. So when that happened, it, it affected me because I knew I had friends who were affected very directly. But everything in the city was covered with a layer of gray dust. Everything was dirty. When people walked into their apartments in New York, there, it just this cloud of gray followed them in and settled on everything and blew through the windows, even if they were shut. And so there was a very powerful design trend that happened in that year after 9-11 of white, of clean, bright white, because people wanted simplicity, purity, illumination, et cetera. And then we saw that come back again when the modern quilt movement took off, right? Because of all that solid white, that negative space, that clean design aesthetic. So as our world becomes more complex and in some ways more difficult, more stressful, we long for those empty negative spaces of light and illumination. And, you know, it was interesting to me that the first woman of color to become a vice president, that she walked out in white. And so for me, it was also about unity. Uh, it was about, you know, it's, I, I just ha have this image of a flashlight being shown into the dark, dusty, moldy corners uh, where things have been happening that we didn't know about. We're just starting to find out about what has been transpiring. And we want to know more. We want to understand. We want to shine that flashlight. We want to shine light on everything. But there are a lot of quotes about dark and light, about shining light into the darkness, and about you have to have light to cast a shadow and so on. That I think we're going to be thinking about those parables and, the, and those quotes as we move into this time of yin and yang and dark and light and what's hidden and what's illuminated. And I, you know, color trends represent what we yearn for. It's a mass consciousness or mass unconsciousness that we're drawn to things and we can't always put them into words, but we know when we look at it, that that's what we want. That's what we're feeling. That's what we believe. That's beautiful. Um, I would be remiss if I did not ask you to talk about what is behind you on your chair and what oh. is behind you on the wall, because I know that all of our viewers <laughs> are going to want to know. Yeah. Well, in addition to being an artist and an entrepreneur and a curator, I'm also a little bit of a collector. And uh, the three pieces on the wall here this is by one artist, uh, part of the Tent Makers of Cairo Collective. And I actually purchased these in Birmingham a couple years ago. And I was one of the sponsors of the film that was made about the Tent Makers of Cairo. 
and I'm friends with uh, Jenny Bowker. In fact, I've gone to her home and seen her studio in Australia and spoken to her guild. So I have a special connection to her. And of course, she lived in Egypt and she uh, brought this group of artists for all of us to appreciate and enjoy several years ago. I actually, when she first brought them to Birmingham uh, many years ago, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, I did a couple interviews with the artists then, and you can see those on our video page. But anyway, these I thought were interesting because the birds are based on the temples of Karnak, but to me, I'll just show you again, they look very Central American. So I just thought that was an interesting combination. And this piece here, you're asking about that? <laughs> This is a great piece. So uh, my friend, Kathy Price, who runs Mission of Love, this is one of the seven charities that we give to. And it, it, at the end of the year, we reached 1.75 million that we've raised for charity. Um, she does a lot of work in Pine Ridge, South Dakota, working with the Lakota people. And one day I got a call from her. She said, I hope you don't think I'm crazy, but I found this piece of artwork on the garbage dump and I knew that you had to have it and I rescued it and she wrapped it up and shipped it to me. And it's all buttons and beads and like found objects that have been, I don't know if you can see that, but it's a, a heart and hands. And she said, oh, and you can see my, one of my polar bear photos there too. Uh, she said, when I saw it, I knew that you had to have it and she was right. Yeah, it, it, it really is. Um, a, a, interesting way to encapsulate a lot of what your life has been about. Is there anything that I haven't asked you that you would like to say about, <clears throat> excuse me, about color forecasting? Hmm. Well, I initially got involved with color in general as an artist, as a painter. And I've always felt that color is very healing. And that when we work, when we're drawn to certain colors and when we work with certain colors, or even when we're repulsed by certain colors, <clears throat> that is a message to us from our unconscious, you know? So a lot of times we're like, man, I got to make a blue and white quilt, or <clears throat> I need to make this pink quilt, you know? And consciously we may say, oh, you know, I, I knit that pink hat last year to wear to that march or you know something like that and yet there if we're drawn to spend a month or six months or a year working on a project that focuses on that color that's about us and there's something there that we need and looking at that color every day is feeding us and potentially healing us so i i always invite people to think about that when you're drawn to a color or a group of colors what is that you know you could say energetically or spiritually or psychologically. Um, you know, there have been a lot of uh, psychology uh, studies where they have studied the effects of, you know, when people spend so much time in a pink room, what does it do to them? <laughs> Things like that. I mean, there's a whole body of research on that. And I would just invite everybody to think about that. You know, how has that been expressed in their life and some of the big projects they, they've taken on and what's going on in their life at that time. 